Hello, good evening. Um, we are just waiting for all the participants to join us before we officially start. Uh, so we'll just give that a couple of minutes. Thank you. Okay, well, I will officially say good evening um, and welcome to the launch of our Story Recycling Bank project as part of this year's Being Human Festival. Um, my name is Dr. Lisa Blower and I'm the uh, course leader and senior lecturer in creative and professional writing at Wolverhampton University and I'm joined by my colleagues and fellow writers here Dr Rob Francis aka RM Francis, um, Charlie Barnes, Dr Charlie Barnes aka CS Barnes the crime writer and Dr Ines Gregoria Labata and I don't think there's a, a pseudonym for you is there <laughs> or an aka Ines so you like myself and go by your your name in terms of all, yes, absolutely, authorial status. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, I thought I would just quickly start by um, just giving you a little bit of background uh, to what the Being Human Festival is all about. Um, the humanities in general is a place that is there to challenge the big subjects that are um, you know, mattering within and across our various cultures. And this festival is very much a celebration of what the humanities do in terms of continuing to contribute to those cultures. Um, and this year is of particular interest given its theme and how we might explore it in context of, of the pandemic, um, which thwarted much of the arts and those especially reliant upon public engagement. And, you know, we can also put it in context as well of the uh, climate change crisis. Um, the festival's uh, theme this year is renewal. Uh, and for us uh, here in Creative and Professional Writing, this was very much about this renewed sense of power in the arts um, that really has kind of enabled most of us to get through the global pandemic. And when you think about it and how we all kind of turn to the arts, 
we turned to box sets to binge. We caught up with mini series and documentaries. We, we turned back to our radio platforms. We renewed all our hobbies in art. Uh, Grayson's Art Club on Channel 4 was hugely successful. I, I don't know whether any of you saw it or, or tuned in on a weekly basis like me and my family did, but that was attracting almost a million viewers per week. We also reindulged in our passion for books and audio books in particular. Um, book sales alone uh, during the pandemic were hitting an eight year high. Um, it was certainly the year of the podcast. Uh, every man and his dog uh, started to produce a podcast, mainly because artists who rely on those ticket paying audiences were still looking for ways to connect to those audiences, to almost remind them that they were still there. Um, National Theatre Live, they brought West End and RSC production to our TV sets and all literary festivals went online so everyone now had the chance of a front row seat. I mean the creative industries really did repurpose itself during this time. It got inventive and it rejuvenated its platforms uh, with many success stories. Uh, the Arvon uh, Creative Foundation, for example, set up its online fourth house and this expanded its reach by a staggering 500%, would you believe, uh, enabling writers from across the globe to participate in uh, masterclasses and online writing retreats. So in a word, the arts was very defiant. And in this kind of renewed environment, our stories were still finding a way to be told. Why am I all telling you this? Well, mainly because this is what inspired our bid to be part of this year's Being Human Festival. And so led by Professor Mina Dander, we in creative and professional writing very much focused upon this idea of storytelling. And it all came under this banner of riches, uh, resurgence and commemorati on humour, exchange and storytelling. Because as writers, yes, we're rich in storytelling, in the exchanging of stories, we tell and we tell and we retell and we retell again. Um, because stories do travel and we can't help but, you know, tell our tales um, because, you know, writers are perpetual recyclers of material and stories will always find new routes to reach readers when needed. I mean, as writers in particular, which is what, you know, we're going to go on to discuss this evening, is the fact that we draw from all sorts of texts, sources and materials that have existed and evolved over the centuries. You know, we're re reconfiguring their origins, we are re reimagining them as otherwise, in order to produce this renewed take on the original form. And I mean, let's not forget all this renewed interest that I've just been talking about in the arts during those lockdowns last year and the ways in which the creative industry reconfigured the ways people accessed it, made it more inclusive. And, and also it was renewing these ideas of creative passions. So we then started to think about what we do in creative and professional writing, um, how we encourage new voices, inspire new voices, how we um, encourage those new voices to explore what's been written before in order for them to try and retell it again or to perhaps imagine it as otherwise. We're constantly asking our students to cut or almost reimagine their own stories in their own practice. And also this idea of never throwing anything away. Um, and based on this idea that writers are perpetual recyclers, you know, and sort of going through these acts of renewal, revision, retelling, reimagination, reconfiguration, the Story Recycling Bank project was born. And it's a project really that explores how, as writers, not only do we recycle material, but we're also very 
consciously aware of this process that we are recycling. And so the point of this launch really is to give you some examples of how we as writers have been recycling material or recalling uh, or our inspirations of specific authors or using uh, century old legends in order to create new material. Um, and this is where I'm going to bring in my colleagues. Uh, what is going to happen is, is that I'm going to come to each one of them and you're very kindly going to read an extract of a piece of creative work uh, that you have recycled. Uh, you're going to give us a burst of that uh, material and then we're going to have a quick chat uh, about what inspired you to use this particular urban myth uh, of which I'm going to uh, come to Rob because you, your debut novel Bella was a retelling of the urban myth Bella and the Witch Elm uh, and we'll just talk about the process behind that whether or not um, that process was very conscious or actually was it something that began and we very much you know a sort of subconscious process uh, until we started to realize that actually we've started to retell something from before. So Rob can I come to you first with your extract from Bella please. Absolutely. Thanks very much, Lisa, and uh, thanks everybody for tuning in this evening. Uh, so uh, this is Bella, and uh, I'm going to give you uh, a little bit of uh, a taster from this debut novel, which, as Lisa says, is a, in many ways a, a, a retelling of the old regional uh, local legend, Who Put Bella in the Witch Elm? Um, for those that don't know, it's uh, 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 at the the end of the Second World War, a group of scouts went hunting for eggs in some local woods and found the skeletal remains of a woman. Um, and to this day, they've not been able to figure out who she was or where, why she got there. And there's loads of really curious bits of information about it and loads of really wonderful conspiracy theories relating to it. Um, and around the same time uh, and continues to this day, uh, graffiti started to appear saying I put Bella down the witch elm and I know who put Bella down the witch elm so it's this uh, great local legend that uh, remains a mystery and remains uh, part of the kind of cultural psyche of the black country um, and uh, yeah it came out with wild press books and uh, here's a little extract and this is the voice of Bella the ghost of the story memory is difficult I can barely piece it together. I can see the tree and I can sense the woods, all the filthy dusk of it, but memory is difficult. Memory is difficult when you're dead. There's no sense of self or space or time, just a sideshow of fragments. I can see the tree and I can sense the woods. There's lust and moisture, kisses and touches. Memory is difficult. I can see the tree. It sits thick and squat, dry skin warts over every inch of trunk and branch. Mosses creep in cracks of bark. I see brown, umber, khaki, tan. It's too heavy for itself, too heavy for the soil, ripped, sucking at roots. Covens of fungi pitch plots about the base. Lover's words etched in by penknife strokes sap still spitting from the new tattoos she wrote our names in there but memory is difficult i can sense the woods all the filthy dusk of it our tree sits thick and squat in barren mud fenced off by a circle of brackens and beach back from here are barely visible paths beaten down by footprints of us who needed seclusion you cut through brambles, nettles, foxgloves that nest in dead bell pits. Currents of brown and green breed from clay brine spars. She led me by the hand through here. Memory is difficult when you're dead. It's the click snap rustle that ferrets in echo snaps through these woods. You don't see the birds and rodents, but they're here. A new plops, unseen. Adders coil under piles of wood limbs. You see as you step away from others. There is lust, 
She held my hand as we stepped to the tree, rubs a thumb along my finger to reassure. Each step speeds the heart. She knows the way despite the dark. You still sense Saltwell's lush. She led me by the hand to that circle of bracken and beech. There is lust and moisture, kisses and touches here against the witch elm. This is where she led me. I see the tree and I sense these woods. I am still here. You call me Bella. Thank you very much. Oh, that's wonderful. I, I do I do love that section in the book, I must admit. I mean, Rob, what inspired you to recycle this urban legend <laughs> and turn it into your debut novel? Um, a couple of reasons, really. Um, the, the first one is it's, it's a story that's been with me since childhood and that we passed yeah. around as kids and added to through yeah. family stories and whatnot. So it always gripped me in that way. Um, so there's a sort of kind of shared experience across the region of the story in lots of different guises. Mm. Um, and th the other reason is because I, I, I love the open endedness of it. I love the mystery of it. I love the fact that there are so many different routes into mm. the occult and into Cold War conspiracy theories and into all sorts of different territories. Um, so the open endedness of it really attracted me. Um, mm. and, and the other side of it was there was so there are so many other local artists and local writers that have tackled Bella and yeah. at first sort of put me off you know I mean the, the, there's a there's a musical symphony by the agents of evolution uh, there's a really great film called Bella by uh, Tom Rutter from Carney Films uh, there's a really wonderful poetry collection by Nellie Faye Cole um, yes, and yes. I felt like in the same way that Simon Armitage had added to Arthurian legend and how mm -hmm. other writers like uh, Stephen Fry had added to uh, Greek legends and, um, and Norse legends. I, I was doing something similar, um, but very, very local and, and black country specific. So that sort of attracted me as well. Mm. I think that's the thing, isn't it, as well, because that's one of the things that we uh, often discuss, because I think all of us as a department, we're very kind of fixated on notions of place and regionality and roots and the stories within the landscape, aren't we? And um, I mean, Innes, I'm probably going to come to you next. And you've also drawn from a folk tale. Was it is it something was it a kind of the sense of that regional tale that you that sort of struck you that was the most inspiring thing to go with or is it the fact that you feel that these existing stories have more to say yeah i think that it's it's the fact that the stories have more to say and also yeah. that the stories reveal something about the culture itself you know yeah i'm really interested in environmental psychology i'm really interested in the notion of place identity and that places are these kind of shifting dynamic things um of, of memories and smells and food and family and buildings mm -hmm. and iconic people and whatnot that that starts to kind of imbibe itself onto our sense of self um, mm -hmm. and, and a big part of that are the stories we tell of places and the stories we tell to each mm -hmm. other that are kind mm. of called driven as well. Mm. And I think it is, is that idea as well. Sorry, Innes, we'll come to you now. <laughs> um, but it is also that idea, isn't it? Of um, like, particularly with Bella, I, you know, I'm familiar with a number of versions of that story. Mm. And in a way, are they retellings? Do you know what I mean? Or is it just people kind of telling the same story, you know, telling the same story? Uh, is it is it a retelling if that story is so ambiguous anyway? Yeah, it's more like they're reimaginings, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, we, we, we've we've got the the uh, the, the half built scaffold of a story, and and perhaps that's why so many artists and writers are drawn to it. Yeah, that's true. So, Innes, can I come to you next, please? Um, because I understand that you're going to give us a reading from a story where you recycle the folk myth of the knocker. Um, do, yeah. 
Do <laughs> tell. <laughs> yeah, so uh, for those of you who don't know who the knockers are, the knockers are supposed to be these kind of like uh, creatures for, from uh, British folklore who live in the mines underground. Um, yeah, and um, so this is an extract from a short story that is set in the Coniston copper mines. So Coniston is up in the Lake District. So I'm just gonna read a little extract from the middle of the story, but just to give you a bit of context, the main character is um, is this young woman who is really struggling in her life. Um, she is a PhD student and she has lots of jobs to be able to support her uh, her her academic career. And she's really struggling with all these jobs and trying to find like a place. Um, and one night she goes alone to the Coniston Copper Mines because she really loves caving. So going inside caves, you know, and, um, and that sort of thing. Uh, but she goes there alone at night and she's sort of um, going through the mines and we don't know what she's looking for exactly. And that's revealed at the end of the story. But yeah, I just wanted to give you that context. And this section starts when um, she's already halfway through uh, through the mines in the darkness. So um, the path finished at the bottom of a large shaft. Old rock formations crept up like the columns of, a, of an experimental basilica. Tongues of silvery blue shone down as if encrusted with diamonds. She took one of her gloves off to caress the mountain's insides. It felt crisp, cold, vivifying. Her hands changed into eyes and she moved them around until she sensed the rope. She had hoped it was still there. It was abraded and didn't pass all the safety tests, but there wasn't any other option. She pulled it a couple of times. Knock. She looked back. Knock, knock. Nothing. There had been legends about the Coniston copper mines, deaths, accidents, ghosts, and the object of her current research, the knockers. There were different versions of what they looked like. In her imagination, they were tall, bony creatures, thin enough to squeeze through holes, a skin the color of dirty beeswax, small blind eyes, they had no use for them down there. They sensed things with the thin whiskers they had instead of eyebrows and around their mouths. And with their hands, like albino spiders. Hands that were so used to holding pigs that these had become an extension of their slender bodies. Pigs to break down the mountain's guts. She started the ascent. Using the single rope technique to go up had always reminded her of swimming. Her body pushed against the darkness like it was water in the depths of the ocean. The torch revealed other colors, emerald, deep blue, purple. As she moved up, the landscape around her seemed to reconfigurate himself. The parts where the light shone no more turned into dust. A dripping sound told her she had reached the wooden level. There was water running down the tunnel, just a thin layer of it, fed by the crying walls. She went past other smaller holes, some of them filled with dark blue water. Knock, knock. She looked down, fear she might have dropped something, but there was only darkness beyond the small hollow from her head torch. Knock, knock, knock. In many of the tales she had studied, the knockers were the guardians of the cave. But considering they spent a black eternity breaking through it, they were more like slaves. It was also said that knockers enjoyed hiding miners' tools away and messing up with the machinery. That's why miners left food and spare tools behind, to make friends with them and keep them content. She wasn't scared of the knockers. She understood them. She had spent her life using a metaphorical peak to break through an infinite list of tasks set by someone else. Trapped, 
always working, always pushing forward, no matter how hard the wall was. It was in her essence, like it was in the knocker's soul, to work harder, harder. You need a job to earn your independence, her father used to tell her. You focus on earning a living first, then you do what you want, don't need to answer to anyone. He had said that with pride. He talked about people who didn't work with disgust, housewives, his friends, adult children who have gone back home after university because they couldn't find a job, the royal family. She had got her first part-time gig at 13, delivering newspapers around the neighborhood. After that came tutoring younger children. She had been so excited back then. It all had seen a noble enterprise. Now, 16 years later, there wasn't much pride left. Only the despair of having realized that the tunnel she was caving led to nowhere. Yeah, and that's that's it. Oh, that is lovely. Do you know, I, I just listening to that, and I don't know about you, Charlie and Rob, but could you hear it, lots of similarities between <laughs> Rob's and Innes's in terms of tone, mood, narrative tension um you know just through these kind of retellings or recycling procedures do you think there are these narrative elements that we we kind of use in order to you know recreate this material in our own way because you know even though it's our voices and our new story the similarities between the two um it one one chapter could almost feel like to lead on to the other Maybe we, we need to write a book together, Rob, now. <laughs> Whenever it's, you're ready. Whenever you're yeah, ready. yeah. But I, do you think it's something to do, you know, is it to do with this kind of open-endedness that Rob was talking about? Um, maybe. I feel like, uh, like Rob was saying, you know, there is so much in these folk myths anyways that can still be explored. Mm. Um, like in my case, for example, I wanted to compare the idea of the knocker, this like kind of monstrous creature, speaking in the minds yeah the feeling of that felt really similar to something that I feel like a lot of people in my I would say my generation but I think it doesn't necessarily it doesn't necessarily apply to my generation but this feeling of like working really hard but going nowhere um mm. because I feel like um even though we grow up thinking that jobs you know you have to work and there is dignity in having a job and so on and so forth Mm. I feel like these days it's so incredibly difficult to find a job. The jo jobs can be so dehumanizing as well. Mm. Uh, sometimes you have to have more than one to survive. And um, and I just, you know, I was I was actually in the <laughs> Coniston Copper Mines myself. Yeah, yeah. So again, place is very important as well, like Rob was saying. And those two things just connected. So I feel yeah. that, yeah, expanding those, I mean, this means are meant for something, right? It's because we can still go back and find new things in them that apply now as well. Yeah, because there is something, um, I, you know, I think that what we do as writers is that we are, up, you know, it, it's almost as if stories exist underground, isn't yeah. it, in a way? And we are kind of unearthing them and uprooting them. Uh, and I know, Rob, if I could bring you back in here, you have a lovely analogy, don't you? A lovely kind of family tree analogy uh, when it comes to this whole process of recycling stories. I do indeed, yeah. Um, this, this is something that I, um, I, uh, I keep uh, as a, a regular refrain for my students um, <laughs> in, in both my, uh, my first year's telling tales uh, module and my my third year's genres is that we want to think ourselves as as writers as kind of contributing to an ecosystem contributing to a culture that's an ecosystem and one and a useful way of thinking about that is that and, and because of that ecosystem we're constantly picking up things that's already been done or seeds that have already been sown and mm -hmm. also growing new ones and so mm -hmm. you can kind of think about the literary history and the literary landscape as this great big tree and in order for the tree to survive it needs to establish new stems and new roots and new branches and new fruits and that's what the kind of contemporary writer is doing 
but it also mm. needs to be attached to the tree. So it needs mm. to be attached and rooted to the traditions of the past. And in mm. doing that, we keep the old alive and protected as well as uh, driving at something cutting edge. Mm. I, I, I mean, to be honest, I, you know, I think it is such a lovely way that sort of sums up this project, isn't it? Because uh, I know what um, one of the things that was driving uh, Professor Mina Danda's ideas behind this was this idea of defiance, you know, and it is this idea that the words themselves defy disposal. And, you know, kind of what we are talking about here is that in a way, like both of your pieces, these are stories that are already written, but you know they haven't been written until you write them again. Do you know what I mean? And it's this idea that we're always asking ourselves, what if things are other than they are? But Charlie, you are, have gone down that magpie route because the other things that writers are, and we are all self-confessed magpies in the fact that we beg, borrow and steal. And your extract, I believe, borrows directly from the wonderful David Foster Wallace. Yes, I've set myself big shoes to fill. I'm not quite sure why I thought this was <laughs> such a good idea. Now we've actually got to it. Um, but yeah, so I am um, reading from a collection of short fiction. Um, it's actually my first ever book. So it feels like it was a really long time ago now, although I'm, it wasn't really, it was just a few years. Um, the collection itself is called The Women You Were Warned About. Um, and it's made up of um, quite experimental short story structures. Um, I was really kind of working through some things and flexing some muscles and essentially just trying on different flavours of writing, uh, which I'm a, I'm a big believer in. Um, and I won't say too much about the inspiration behind it because I feel like it will probably, you know, be better if we come to that afterwards. But um, I... Um, during my own studies became completely infatuated with David Foster Wallace and I don't think I'm quite over it yet um and I I fell head over heels for his uh brief interviews with Hideous Men collection um and it's a really kind of scathing critique on American masculinity and representations of the of the modern man as it was when he was writing um and I kind of uh, I suppose I wanted to answer that in some way um I think it was I think it was something that I felt like I, I needed to create a dialogue with um so I wrote a series of short extracts called um brief interviews with hideous women um so I'm actually going to read um the first in the collection which is uh, an ongoing interview with the narrator um and then I'm gonna skip a little bit ahead um, to read a snippet from, from a later one, if I can be cheeky and shoehorn, shoehorn two in. Um, so an ongoing interview with the narrator. Question. And I suppose that's where I come in, is it? No one likes a grass, you know. If I wasn't so tired of this place, then I wouldn't be doing it at all. You're just giving me something to do. I don't even know what you think you're getting at with this book. Question. Because no one believes anything bad of women. That's why this place is so popular. No one can quite believe what goes on behind the walls, you know? Meek and mild women can't do this, that or the other. And that's what people will think. Fiction or not, people will see a catchy title about terrible women or hideous women, whatever it is. They'll pick it up, glance at the back maybe and think, well, that sounds a little too far-fetched and it'll sit on the shelf with the rest of the books about bad ladies that no one is interested in reading. Question. The world only likes certain types of monsters and women ain't it. They're society's backbone or touchstone if you like. They're the reminder that mankind and womankind are two separate breeds entirely. And that's why people can't handle it when women balls up I mean. We need to believe in a higher power that lords it over men. And although they won't have it, men, that is, the higher power, moral high ground, pedestal purchase, well, that's women. And that's why when they do go up with something and the world bravely decides to acknowledge it for once, that's why we all have such a hard time coming to terms with it. 
but but why a woman can't possibly do such a thing everyone cries because that's what we tell ourselves isn't it that's what we need to believe question no love not just as bad as men worse than we're naturally malicious, cunning, secretive. Even our genitals stay tucked out of the way. And if that doesn't seem suspect, then I don't know what does. Women don't like serving things up front anymore. Maybe they did, but we're going back some years now, probably to the days when men were still gentlemen rather than lads. That's when women were women rather than you're shaking your head. You don't agree. Question. Well, if I can't say it about women, then who can? Men aren't allowed to say it these days without getting called out on it. And women are getting away with murder for it. Not literally, no, before you say anything about that. But you know what I mean? One wrong word from a bloke and it's misogyny, woman hater, blah, blah. But women, men are all scum. Make them leave. We don't need them anymore. And what are, what are women who say that? Liberated, empowered, idiots. And don't look at me like that because you know it's true. You're a woman writing a book about terrible women, so you're in no position to defend them. Christ, you're trying to make a living off the terrible things that women do. And that's fine, by the way, because there are a lot of terrible things. I just like to think we're getting to a point, though, where we're allowed to talk about it openly. And that's what I'm doing here. That's why you picked me. Honest to a fault when it comes to my opinions, a little less so when it comes to cold hard facts, admittedly, but you'll mostly get the truth from me. Question. I could tell you some stories about the women in here. It's a stereotype these days that women gas a lot and share a bit more than they really should, but not so much a stereotype as a factual look at the female and her ways, I think. Let me tell you, and this place will vouch for it, if you put a group of women in close proximity with bugger all to do for a prolonged period of time, it will take, on average, a month for them to learn each other's life stories. They talk and talk and trade and talk. There are some women in here whose names I don't even know, but I can tell you how old they were when it first occurred to them that they could kill their husbands. Stories galore, I tell you, but no, not so good with the names. Not that I suppose that matters much. You'll be changing them, won't you? Anonymity and all that. These women talk the talk in here, but I'm not sure they'd want the great reading public to know too much about their unmentionables. There's not a whole lot to be proud of in these stories. I think I might leave it there, actually. I feel like I, I feel like I've been brave enough. <laughs> oh, that is brilliant. Um, would you call it a retelling if you are almost emulating the narrative style rather than like Innes and Rob? Re, you know directly retelling yeah. a, 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 or reimagining a folk tale slash urban myth what would you I, call it <laughs> I feel in. like I feel like it's more borrowing the structure or yeah. or answering the original um yeah answering yeah. the original um I remember yeah. um I remember reading um Foster Wallace's interviews and thinking well they're great and they're really they're really doing something special but where but where are the women yeah and um, and I was really I like in my own in my own kind of research background I look a lot at representations of women and kind of this mm. this force field that exists around presenting unpleasant female characters yeah. and and it just felt to me like brief interviews with hideous men was this was this wonderful collection that shone a scathing light on modern masculinity and I thought well why is there not a female equivalent to to this or why aren't there multiple female equivalents yeah, yeah, yeah. to this where where we can kind of sit down and have a dialogue about how it's actually not you know unpleasant like unpleasant behaviors aren't aren't or shouldn't be gendered they are human behaviors um mm -hmm. and it just it just felt like that wasn't something that was as openly discussed I think yes yeah 
yeah but as, I suppose that's what it is isn't it it's like a dialogue you know yeah. um, a dialogue between two texts and um you know one of the things that are, I've done with the students is that I've given them Raymond Carver's Why Don't You Dance and also Stephen King's Premium Harmony yeah. which he begins with thing you know thinking of Raymond Carver and it's mimicking that minimalist style isn't it so yeah. um can we just kind of pause here and perhaps uh, come together as a, a as a department of writers <laughs> and you know are there any kind of tips or advice that you would give other writers about this kind of recycling process because obviously the point of this is that we are also inviting other writers to be part of our project I'm, does I'm anybody want to yeah like, um, I, I mean, from my own from my own experience, it, it, it's been a really worthwhile and useful uh, exercise um, in sort of quite often deliberately borrowing people's styles or borrowing people's mm -hmm. or, or genres blueprints uh, or indeed their uh, their form itself. I mean, what. One of the first really big projects that I ever undertook as a writer, uh, which will never see the light of day, um, <laughs> was a retelling of Walt Whitman's song to myself. Oh. Um, and what I did there was kind of take the American and make it British, take mm -hmm. the kind of uh, wide expansing, expanding optimism and make it more sort of nihilistic, yeah. I suppose. Um, yeah. And... Um, and the other side of it was uh, I tried to, as faithfully as possible, uh, copy him line by line, meter by meter, syllable by syllable, yeah. and um, try and sort of retranspose his imagery as well. Uh, and, and that really just taught me a hell of a lot about what goes into mm -hmm. a poem. And it was particularly mm -hmm. useful taking Whitman as an example of that because, you know, from face value, he's just writing freely and just doing his own thing. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, it taught me what goes in on a very, very yeah. uh, kind of first-hand basis. Yeah. And I, I suppose, in a way, what you're kind of saying is that writers learn from writers before you know we're all kind of learning from each other and actually taking it right back down to basics those fundamental elements which is what you're doing enables you not just necessarily to copy but you're kind of reconfiguring aren't you um it's charlie anything i mean you know what tips would you have because i mean obviously we're talking about subverting subjects perhaps we can change the perspective we can gender swap uh you know Anything else to add to the list? I think um, I was really conscious and am really conscious that I borrowed from an author who has a glorious standing and an outrageously experimental back catalogue. Yeah. Um, but I I don't know whether I was young enough or brave enough or a little <laughs> bit of both um, to actually have quite, quite a lot of faith in the fact that I was also bringing my own stamp to it. And I think... I think it's important to remember if you are given a text to work with, whether it's something that you choose or whether it's something that you're given, you are you are not finishing that text for another person. Like you are not mm -hmm. writing on behalf of another writer. You are writing with your own writing agenda. Yeah. Um, that might mean a gender swap or it might mean playing around with perspective or it might mean completely copying the author's style and trying to be as loyal to their original work as possible kind of whatever whatever your approach to it is like you are coming to this as an individual writer with your own with your own kind of bag of tools yeah. and your yeah. own this is what I want to do as a writer and I think this in particular is a wonderful opportunity to be hugely experimental and push boundaries yeah. and and do you know even even us kind of in the in the in the throes of our writing careers let's say this will still prevent us uh, present us rather with opportunities to go okay how do I as a writer respond to yeah. something rather than how do I as a mimicker 
or how do I as a finisher yes, um, yeah. so I think I think it's important to kind of hold your own I suppose as much yeah. as as much right. as you can is what I would say yeah it is it's almost like uh, you know what you know that there is a reason why that work is speaking to you yeah, in yeah. order for you to, uh, for you as a writer to want to respond to it in a, in a kind of copycat way yeah uh, but then you're, you know, you're discovering your own kind of like narrative groove, as I always call it, uh, you know, but you're using the work of the masters, maybe. Yeah. Um, Innes, uh, any kind of tips and advice from you? I mean, obviously, because uh, we are asking people to get involved, don't we, and dispose of their trash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you said it what Rob and Charlie already said, but I would say that's also why it's so important to, first of all, read and read a lot as a yeah. writer, um, just to see what people before you have done before. Yeah. Like you say, that's how you subvert the cliches or like how you reinvent like stereotypes. So I would just say my main advice is read as much as you can, because the more you read is the more um, you have to play with really, like coming yeah, back yeah, to your analogy, true. Rob of the tree. Yeah. But the roots are there, right? And the roots take the nutrients up to the branches and the leaves. So you need to, to you need to know those roots. Um, so yeah, that's my main advice: read yeah. as much as, <laughs> as yeah. Much as um, the, the reason I'm asking uh, my fellow writers there for advice and tips is because obviously, as part of this project, I mean, uh, you know, we are looking at aspects of recycling stories anyway from an academic point of view but we're also doing this from a creative point of view and part of the idea of the story recycling bank is that uh, we are inviting you, you to dispose of your trash and what we kind of mean by this is those jottings those ideas that went nowhere those poems that you don't think you'll ever finish something that you've started to write that you thought was absolutely brilliant and you've come back to it two months later and thought you know what <laughs> this deserves to go in the bin please don't do that um we're asking you to dispose of it, to uh, email it anonymously. Uh, so no name or anything like that on the actual work. What we do ask you to do, unfortunately, is waiver all creative claim to it, because what we're going to do is give that work to another writer who is also taking part in this project. So they will turn what you consider to be your trash into a piece of creative treasure. And then we're going to ask people to email them back in with a little bit of a paragraph about their experience of this recycling process. And the whole idea or the whole objective behind this is for us to, you know, really kind of understand the experience of recycling stories and that actually it doesn't necessarily have to be inspired by a famous author or a homage uh, to an author that, um, you know that we kind of read all their back catalogue because that's who we want to write like or perhaps it's not necessarily inspired by a, a concrete myth or something that exists within our kind of regional tales that we feel that we want to put our spin on it this is somebody else's work where they've really got nowhere with it so you know we, we're doing this as well to encourage you to interact uh, and to see what your experience is of that recycling process and to share your kind of tips and advice as well. Um, I am, we're probably going to kind of tie up in a minute uh, towards the end. I know Rob has got a really beautiful poem to end. Um, but in terms of my contribution to this, um, I am a writer who has always been a massive fan of Alan Bennett. Uh, one of the reasons that I absolutely love him is the fact that he uses voice to both tell a story, but then he infers a hundred others. And I remember reading Talking Heads at uh, Sixth Form College many moons ago, and it was that book that really made me want to be a writer. I read that book thinking, crikey, how can I write like this? How does he do this? Because it's when you read uh, Alan Bennett's stories for me anyway, uh, and you get to the end, not thinking about that story, but there is like, you're, you're thinking about everything that's been unsaid. Um, so I'm going to read to you from the beginning of a short story called Chuck and Die. Uh, 
which is my homage to Alan Bennett. I found it in his shed, sat on his good toolbox it was with the price tag left on. Minton, Grassmere, 40 pieces, 500 quid, all boxed up, never used. Of course, there was no way I could have said anything. I shouldn't have been in there in the first place. I could have said I was getting the emergency chairs out ready for Sunday, what with his sister and her brood coming for the dinners. And we all know what Chuck's sister's like when she sat on a three-piece air in her views after a couple of sherries. But there was no point going down that road when I'd been promising Monica I'd turned a corner. I still called Monica to tell her what I'd found. She told me to breathe, breathe, die, in, out, in, out, then asked me where he was. I said, you know where he is? I should kick the bloody door down. She said, blind eye, die, and keep your fists in the suds. I said, Monica, it's a spare room as that, not a museum. And there's another 40 piece dinner service he's just bought. She said, I'd be careful who you're telling when you call it a spare room. If the council get wind, you'll have to find yourself a lodger. I said, I'm already a housekeeper to a landlord. She said, well, just remember what happened last time. You meet him halfway. Because last time this happened, there was no halfway. Wedgwood Florentine blue it was. Beautiful to look at, but it cleaned us out and broke my heart. I said, what the hell were you ever thinking, Chuck, buying that lot? He said, die, however hard you cherish them, you've got to be prepared for the discoloration in a dinner service and trends. Grassmere, Persian rose, Florentine blue, they're in and out of fashion like a dipper's drawers. I said Dalton, Minton, Minton and Wedgwood Chuck. No one gives a damn about men like you anymore or for what you made. And whilst we're on the subject, cherish me. He went all doe-eyed on me then, his big left eye wandering. And because I'd upset him, he went and spent the whole day with his collection, dabbing at their faces all tender with that rubbery chamois he'd paid the earth for, wrapping them up again, putting them away. Then he came out of his room all sunshine and smiles with newspaper print and somebody else's stories all over his hands except he was heading for my armchair i said whoa daddy whoa not on my cream armchair you don't because his hands were as black as the night he sat down anyway strumming his fingers on my cushions it was no wonder i saw red but he started it he always does Thank you. My homage to Alan Bennett. Um, so before we tie up, um, as I say, here's, here's what to do if you would like to get involved in our Story Recycling Bank project. We would absolutely love uh, to receive your trash and also to receive your treasure. Um, and if you would like to be part of our uh, live event, because obviously we're allowed to do some public events now, which is wonderful, uh, we'll be at the Lighthouse on Saturday, the 20th of November, between 12 and 2, where the four of us will be back together again, uh, talking about our experiences of being involved in this Story Recycling Bank project, because we've all now got somebody else's trash, haven't we, guys? And uh, we're all in the process of recycling them into uh, our own pieces of work. Uh, and if you, you know, if you are available to join us, please do come along. Um, so thank you very much for be, you know, for coming along this evening. And I think Rob, you're going to end with an armistice, recycled poem. I am indeed. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, I'd like to share this poem. Uh, as Lisa said, it's a, a topical one for Armistice Day. Um, this is uh, a, another recycled story in lots of ways. It's a, a story my granddad used to tell me. Uh, and he was uh, part of the Grenadier Guards, the Staffordshire Regiment of the Grenadier Guards and fought in the Malayan conflict. Uh, uh, and yeah, I'm just going to go straight in and say it. It's called Lost Documents. His name was Boxer. I never knew why. The old grenadier begins to try to recall the thick fear humidity of Kuala Lumpur to Burdity, where gunmen knew emergency was just another word. Insurgents squatting and ready in the jungle fen, tamed by the torture of their children. We don't talk of that. He carried on with Boxer, who never tarried through mire or fire. He snapped images of any insect 
plant or burnt village, to Boston camera. He shot Sakai, Batek, MNLA, got us to watch his camera when out on manoeuvres, feeding swamp bombs to the hidden, waiting for the rash race of indiscriminate bone ash. But we don't talk of that. We never dwell on them negatives. We tether the developing to more tethers, send an aid parcel in bad weathers and shake off the campaign dust, governing the way unnamed towns rust. I told him no. Stan starts up again. What if it broke or fell to the fen? So he took it with him, last time I'm out. Shot in the neck. And we'd never learn about what was behind the lens. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, uh, and thank you very much, as I say again, um, thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Innes. It's been absolutely wonderful to hear your recycled work. Uh, and we look forward to uh, receiving yours. Thanks very much. <laughs>